beginning of the 21st century, the Earth needed to find a new way to keep up with the data from over 30 billion connected devices. Just 30 billion. <laughs> A bold group of researchers and computer scientists in Silicon Valley had a breakthrough they called the machine. It changed computing forever, and it's been part of every new technology for the last 250 years. Everything? Everything. This year, Hewlett Packard Enterprise will preview the machine and accelerate the future. See Star Trek Beyond. Our next speaker is someone I've known for a very long time, and I think most of you know him as well. Uh, Grant Likely has been in the kernel community for uh, over a decade uh, and has worked on a variety of things uh, to make this community stronger and better. Uh, recently, uh, Grant joined uh, HPE, uh, where he's uh, working with that organization on uh, Linux technology and helping them be a better partner in our community. Welcome, Grant Likely. I am well aware that I am the last thing standing between you and the activities and beer tonight, uh, so I figured it was appropriate to wear the red shirt. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, as Jim said, I have joined uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, I've been working in the kernel for many years, and I'm working with their uh, with their Linux team to help get be involved with the community and be part of the upstream development for the products that we ship. Uh, but that, what, I want, what I'm here to talk to you t about today is the, the research project that we have within Hewlett Pan, uh, Packard Enterprise. Uh, with absolutely no hubris whatsoever, I'm saying we're talking about the future of computing. Uh, and this project that we're, uh, is called The Machine. Um, now, you may very well have heard, you've probably heard us, uh, other people from Hewlett Packard talking about the, the machine over the, the last couple of years. Uh, Keith Packard gave keynotes at LinuxCon and LinuxCon Europe last year. You can go and see videos of Martin Fink. So I'm, uh, when he announced it originally. So I'm going to give, I don't want to rehash things that we've already talked about, so that you can consider this a sequel. I'll give a brief uh, summary of what the machine is, and then I want to talk about how we design software to actually make use of this, uh, of this architecture. So to begin with, I just want to remind you that this is a research project. We are exploring new architectures in computing, so this is subject to change. But this is where we see uh, the technology right now. To get started, I'd like to take a look at how we build machines right now. If you look at computer architecture, one of the things that you will see is that we have a hierarchy of storage. Uh, depending on where you, you look at stuff, we've got the CPU with its local, uh, uh, local registers and caches. You've got main memory, which is direct load store access. Uh, off of the SATA bus, you will have your SSD or you'll have uh, rotating disks. And then you'll have a network connection. You can have data stored uh, over on a storage area network or uh, using RDMA to access it. And each one of these different locations where we store data has a different software stack that's used to access it. Uh, and then we spend a bunch of time in our applications moving data around because we need to get data out of storage into memory to do the work that we need to do and then send it back to storage. So the machine project is really asking one very simple question. And that is, what would computer architecture look like, or what would software look like if we were able to collapse the storage hierarchy? How would our software change if we were able to have all of our data in a large pool of direct accessible with load store instructions memory? How would that change the performance of the machines if our entire data set could be instantly available uh, from, from your software without having to worry about different storage stacks depending on where the data was? And that is what we are attempting to build with the, the machine. Let's take a look at it from another, in another way. When we build data centers right now, this is what we do. We take a bunch of machines that have their own local storage. Uh, some of them are compute nodes, some of them are storage nodes. We put them in racks, we put them in the data center, and we connect them all together with the network. And then we have the, the software to move the data around back and forth. And we call this, we've been calling this processor-centric computing because we are designing our software solutions based on 
the limitations of each of those individual machines and the storage limitations that are there. That's why we have the different te technologies. Now, if instead we could start our architecture by taking all of the storage and all the memory and creating one large pool that we put at the center and then attach all of our processing elements around the outside and giving them all equal access to that. Now, we haven't been able to do this before because the technology hasn't been there, but we're working, we think that the technology is moving that direction and we're getting prepared for it now. And this is, this is exactly what we're building with the machine project. So I would like to show it to you right now. Currently, we're working on the first generation of research hardware so that we can explore, develop the software that works with memory-centric computing. And this is a picture of, the, uh, of one of the nodes that's on, on that hardware. And when you look at this, what you, there's three important parts to each node in the machine. First thing you'll notice is we've got four terabytes of fabric-attached memory. We've then got a high-performance SOC, multi-core. And third, we have a, a fabric switch interconnecting them that, allow, that gives us access from the SOC to any location uh, in the fabric-attached memory uh, securely uh, for, and can be allocated for our applications. Now, one note, actually not very interesting. Yes, there's a lot of compute power. Yes, there's a lot of bandwidth. Yes, there's a lot of memory but it's still just one, one node. Where it becomes interesting is when we take 10 of these and populate an enclosure. And then we attack, connect the fabric switches between all the nodes into one large pool. Each one of those nodes has four terabytes, so in an enclosure we have 40 terabytes. But to the processor, it only sees one large pool. So each SOC can, have direct, can be mapped direct access to any location in that uh, 40 terabytes of fabric attached memory. And then we have the capability of putting up to eight of these enclosures in a rack, and then finally we top it off by putting a bog standard PC at the top of it, simply to manage the allocations and man manage the whole machine. So this is the hardware. This is the capability that we're working with, and it allows us to test out, uh, to, to do the research on what software would look like. However, how do we actually use it? Sure, we've got this huge pool of fabric attached memory, but now we need the software to make use of it. And we live in the real world. Uh, we know that the machine isn't going to be useful if we can't run existing workloads on it, if we can't run all, all of the existing software to be able to do MapReduce, to be able to run Apache Spark, to be able to run the big data workloads. So very early on, we knew that we were going to be running Linux on the machine and we knew we were going to be running a lot of existing software. The trick is then teaching that software how to make use of the large pool of memory. And I want to step through that of, exactly, of each of the layers that go through this. So let's start with the operating system. Start with Linux. Fabric attached memory, it's a big pool. It's, but it is, it's big, it's fast, it's persistent, but it's not coherent. So we're not able to run an SMP operating system between all of the nodes, we have to either come up with a new operating system or adapt Linux to deal with this non-coherent memory. Uh, but take another look at the, the diagram that I have here, and you'll notice that each of the SOCs happens to also have a, uh, 256 gigabytes of DRAM each as local memory. And when we've got a processor and we've got memory, it becomes very easy just to put a Linux instance directly on that SOC. And that's what we do. We put every single node has a separate instance of Linux. And this does a couple of very useful things. To begin with, now the computer just looks, uh, it's a familiar software environment. We can do all the, we can run all of the existing software that we have now. Uh, but the other thing that is useful is now the machine, a fully populated machine with all its nodes, looks an awful lot like any other Linux cluster we can use all of the same tools that we currently use for managing Linux machines, for deploying workloads, for managing virtual machines, for, for managing containers that would be running on the architecture. The significant difference, though, between the machine and a traditional cluster is every single node on the machine has attached to it this slightly odd but very large peripheral that represents the fabric-attached memory. 
And that is a concept that we were able to build on to start using uh, useful, um, useful abstractions. So let's go up to the, to the next layer of the software. The big pool of memory isn't useful until we start uh, slicing it up and assigning parts of it into applications. The hardware that we have allows us to uh, do allocations eight gigabyte blocks at a time. And we're able to securely choose which blocks are assigned to which, uh, how, how blocks are assigned, and then also how those, um, which nodes have access to those blocks. So we have eight gigabyte allocation units, and we've been calling those books. Uh, we can do logical allocations of one or more books, so we can get very large applications. And what do you put books on? Well, you put them on shelves, of course. So the logical all allocations we've been calling shelves. And then finally, we have software running on that top of rack uh, management server that we call the librarian that manages the shelves, manages the allocations. That gives us the capability of allocating from the memory. And now the final step, to the, the final piece, is exposing that to the Linux operating system running on each of the nodes. And the way that we've done that is we have written a new file system that runs on Linux they call the librarian file system, whose sole purpose is to expose each one of those shelves as a file in the virtual file system layer. And those files, it's, it's the simplest possible file system. We just want to expose the files. User space applications could open them, it can read and write from them, but they become interesting when we memmap them. And then that gives user space applications direct read write store to fabric attached memory. And the best part about this is we don't assign one shelf to one node. We're able to have node, multiple nodes all sharing the same shelf. And this is where things get interesting. Uh, and it's also where we can, again, we can build on top of that. So the first thing that we could do, uh, a trivial example, is we could take a shelf, assign it to a node, and then loop back mount it. And that gives us a file system. We can put a ext, persistent ext4 file system per node which, great, works, but it's not really very interesting. It's not where we want to go. Where things get interesting is when we have software, app, when we have software libraries that allow for shared access to that, uh, to that region. Uh, one of the things that we've, we have a library that we've been working on that provides a structured object store within a shelf that can be shared between that. We have another library that provides mutual exclusion between nodes because when we're dealing with this, especially with a uh, non-coherent block of memory, we need to coordinate between the nodes. Your, no, your application can directly access its data, but it still needs to be able to coordinate with other nodes when that data is going to change. Uh, and then we can have application specific when we have to, to do in-memory databases. And these are areas of research that we're able to work on now that we have hardware that implements, uh, implements memory-centric computing. And everything just builds up on, top of, up on top of that. So we've added things. We're, to begin with, with the operating system, we've got the Linux kernel. We are endeavoring to use upstream as much as possible. And then we're also building all of this on top of Debian, because we see Debian as a very stable base that gives us the capability that we want and the ability to get in there and uh, add the pieces that we need and the technology that we need back into Debian. Uh, we have the drivers for the kernel. We have drivers for, we have the librarian uh, software, both that runs on the management server and on the, uh, on the nodes. Uh, we have been looking at uh, our DMA because our, again, this is all enabling applications that we already have. And so we can use applications that are already using our DMA can be ported and make use the, of the speed benefits that happens when you've got access to all of the memory directly. Uh, and then finally, we've also got tools that we've been written. As we've been waiting for this hardware, we've already started in on the software development. So there's, we've uh, started with QMU to implement an emulator that allows us to demonstrate. You can take a regular laptop and bring up virtual nodes that have the same behavior as nodes of the machine. And we also have performance tests on, on that. So now why am I talking about this and of all the projects that we have in, internally on, on the machine? One of the things that we decided, 
a fundamental thing that we decided very, very early is that we were going to make use of open source software very, as much as possible. That's not our strategy. Everyone is depending on that these days. Uh, however, before even any of this hardware is available, we want to open source what we're working on because memory-centric computing is, we think that this is how data centers are going to be built in the, new future, in the near future. This is where we see computer architecture going. And if this is where computer architecture is going, then being ready for memory-centric computing is a fundamental thing that needs to get out there and is bigger than Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So we are release, releasing as much as this as we can early before hardware is available. But not only are we releasing this into open source and making it uh, available, but all of the development that we're doing, we are moving outside of the company firewall. We're, trying, we're putting stuff up on GitHub and that is where we're doing the development internally because we think that there's others who are also involved with this that, want to, that will want to see what we're doing and will want to collaborate on how do we make the application stacks that we have right now work in a memory-centric computing environment. So this is my call to you. We are releasing this uh, as much as we can. We are releasing as much as we can under GPL with a DCO process because we're trying to eliminate barriers to collaboration. It is all there, ready to go. Uh, I encourage you to go and take a look at our homepage, which has links to the projects that we've already open sourced and is also the place to go and look as, as new stuff is released. And finally, I've, in my very short amount of time here, I've, had, I've not been able to go into detail, but I don't need to because there's already a bunch of information out there. Go take a look at Keith Packard's talk from LinuxConf Australia earlier this year, or uh, Rocky Craig when he presented at Vault earlier. There's lots of information, there's lots of things to get started. And finally, come to the booth at the upstairs. We have the hardware that I showed you today. We have some uh, space models there, and I'm looking forward to working with you on the machine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're gonna have a reception upstairs uh, at the hub directly following this. Uh, and we also have a scavenger hunt going on through our new mobile app, which is called Pokemon Go. No, it's actually our mobile app, so please use it. See you up at the reception. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Grant.